There was a hidden message in this season four scene from The Chosen. On the surface, Jesus is simply attacking religious leaders, telling them how horrible they are. But when we dive deep into scripture and we look at what was really happening in this moment, we can spot a hidden message in this scene that few people notice, but which may be more important than we realize. Want to know what it is? Well, then join me for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before we start, if you're interested in learning more insights that will help you to understand the Bible more clearly and see it with an entirely new set of eyes, then make sure to click the link above and down in the description where you can download a free book I wrote called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. It's a quick but powerful read that will teach you a whole lot in just a short period of time, just like this video. Speaking of, let's dive in. Okay. So in order to recognize this hidden message, it's important for us to take a look at scripture and understand what has led Jesus into this situation. Why is he letting these religious leaders have it? And we haven't really seen yet what the show will do to lead into this moment, but in scripture, it's not hard to understand why Jesus speaks so harshly of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see, just before this moment, in chapter 22 of Matthew, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have peppered Jesus with question after question, attempting to trap him and condemn him. They've asked him if it was okay to pay the imperial tax to Caesar. They challenged him about what will happen to marriages at the resurrection. They asked his opinion about what was the greatest of all 613 commandments. And in all of these instances, their desire isn't to seek knowledge from Jesus. They're searching for ways to discredit him trying to find charges for which they might accuse him. And what's worse, they're doing it all in front of a crowd. They want to turn people against Jesus. But Jesus is no fool. He knows what's happening, which is why as chapter 23 begins, Jesus addresses the crowd. He says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in the Moses seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Now, when he says Moses seat, Jesus is talking about a seat in the synagogue where the person leading the service would sit each week. After reading from the Torah, he would comment on it. And so Jesus is saying, these are your teachers and they teach you well about what to do, but don't do what they do. And then from that point on, Jesus has nothing good to say about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which is where we find ourselves in this scene. So let's take a closer look at what Jesus is really saying in this scene. As the scene opens, we hear Jesus say, you Pharisees, you cleanse the outside of a cup and the dish, and then you eat and drink food that goes into the body that inside is full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but give as alms those things that are within and behold, everything is clean. Now, these words are being drawn from Matthew 23 and from a similar situation in Luke 11. But there's more to these words than we might think. You see, throughout scripture, the word cup doesn't just refer to a cup itself, but it also refers to the contents of the cup. It's also a word that Jesus has used in Matthew to refer to his suffering, this thing that he must endure. The reference to the dish may have brought to mind the platters inside of the temple, reminders of the platters donated by each of the 12 tribes for the tabernacle, platters which would have at that time been used to collect the blood of temple sacrifices. And what all this would have done is to help them recognize Jesus' greater point. They, the religious leaders, are the cup and the platter. Just as a cup represents what is inside of it, just as a platter reminds them of its greater purpose, Jesus is trying to remind these religious leaders that it is not the rituals and traditions that make them clean and holy. Only the Lord can make things holy. And by forgetting that, they've forgotten who they are. Their insides are unclean, right? Jesus is trying to show them that they have become consumed by greed and wickedness. But what's interesting here is that the actual word Jesus uses for wickedness in Matthew's gospel is the word akrasia, which actually means a lack of self-control. And this really brings out the irony of this whole situation. To this group who prides themselves on their self-control and being able to follow the laws and traditions, Jesus says, yes, you can do that, but you've lost self-control over what really matters. You've lost self-control when it comes to your hearts, your thoughts, your treatment of others. In this, you've strayed greatly. And quickly after that, Jesus makes his next condemnation. As he concludes his criticism of their view of clean and unclean, Jesus mentions giving alms, 
To which the religious leader, Rabbi Akiva, argues that they tithe everything so that the poor can benefit down to the smallest plants in their garden. And again, this is coming directly from Matthew 23 and Luke 11, where Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin and neglect the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. It was necessary to do these things while not neglecting those, blind guides who filter out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, the interesting thing here is that the religious leaders are actually following the law by tithing these small things. Leviticus 27 says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now, there was a debate as to how small of a plant you needed to tithe. And as you can see here, the religious leaders have decided to be as strict as possible so that they don't accidentally disobey this command. But what Jesus is doing here is helping them to see that they've missed the bigger point. You see, at the time of Jesus, they broke the law up into two different types of commandments. Mitzvot kalot referred to light commandments, right? These were things that, to a certain degree, were less important. They didn't carry the same weight as mitzvot kamarot. Mitzvot kamarot referred to heavy or serious commandments. These were major commands that you absolutely had to follow. They were central, serious commands. And what Jesus is suggesting here is that the religious leaders have sacrificed the heavy commands in order to observe the light ones. Right? This is what he means when he mentions justice and mercy and faithfulness. These are the big commands. Right? They're at the heart of the law. But the religious leaders are ignoring them. Right? This is also why he says that they filter the gnat but swallow the camel. They're paying close attention to the small things, but totally ignoring the big ones. Because once again, they've become misguided. Their focus is on the wrong things. And this actually leads us to Jesus' final criticism in this scene. Jesus tells the Pharisees that they love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. And when Jesus makes this comment about synagogues, he's actually talking about something very specific. You see, in a first century synagogue, while the teacher for that day would sit in the Moses seat, everyone else would gather around the room. Most would stand on the periphery or others would sit on the floor around the teacher. But if you were a prominent person in that community, you got to sit in special seats around the edge called chief seats. You couldn't choose to sit in the chief seats. You had to be selected, right? This is where these religious leaders want to be. And Jesus is accusing them of wanting the prominence, of wanting to be above everyone else. Because again, their focus is on the wrong things. And this really helps us to get at the heart of the tension between Jesus and the religious leaders. Because so often we're told that the religious leaders accuse Jesus of breaking the law or that Jesus tells us that we don't need the law. But if you look closely, that's not the case at all. Do you remember that moment earlier in Matthew's gospel during Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Well, those phrases, abolish the law and fulfill the law, are actually idioms. To abolish the law was a Jewish way of saying that you interpreted it incorrectly. And to fulfill the law meant that you interpreted it correctly. So what Jesus is saying is that he hasn't come to misinterpret the law. He's come to interpret it correctly. And this gets at the source of their tension with each other. The religious leaders don't think that Jesus is doing away with the law, right? They think he's misinterpreting it. And they think that he's spreading those misinterpretations, which is exactly how Jesus feels about them. Throughout the entire scene, Jesus has been outlining how he thinks these religious leaders have abolished the law, how they've interpreted it wrong. Their focus is on the wrong things. They've sacrificed the big things for the little things, and they need to return their hearts to the Lord. I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like as Christians, we might need to hear the same message from Jesus sometimes. How often do we focus on the wrong things? How often do we fix our eyes on little differences or on one particular teaching in Scripture while at the same time ignoring the greatest commandment itself? To love the Lord God with our heart, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. You see, this is the hidden message in this scene. If all we ever do when we watch this scene 
is root for Jesus against the Pharisees, then we've missed the bigger picture. We are everyone in this scene. If we're honest, we have moments when we support everything that Jesus wants to do. And we also have others where like the religious leaders, we totally miss the mark. And when we're willing to see that, these moments in scripture can shape us in entirely new ways and draw us closer to Jesus than we ever have been before. Well, that's it for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before you go, make sure to click the link above and down in the description where you can download my free book called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more videos that will help you to see the chosen and the Bible in an entirely new way, then just click this link right here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.